Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Vince Salerno Podcast, episode 76. We're on a roll. <laughs> let's hope we can keep it up. All right. So um, let's just dive right into the show. Um, today, I well, first off, I'm wearing a hat because uh, I was lazy and didn't comb my hair this morning. So um, I got major bed head under this thing. So uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't like to wear hats typically on the show, but um making an exception today because it's early and I'm too lazy to comb my hair. Uh, that is if you're watching on YouTube, if you're listening on audio, then you have no idea what I'm talking about. Okay. So today's show is going to be by no, uh, by, by no planning of my own, a kind of a repeat of last week's show. Last week we talked about Quentin Tarantino's, the movie critic getting canceled, uh, the entertainment weekly article, uh, covering the, horrible Doctor Who costumes and uh, some very um, concerning, questionable comments from uh, Doctor Who showrunner Russell T. Davies and actor Chudi Gawa. Well, a new article on Doctor Who has come out on uh, Variety. Yes, Variety. Uh, and it's kind of ruffled my feathers a little bit uh, on Twitter, got into a few little uh, spats. And uh, on top of that, a new article inside the Quentin Tarantino debacle and why he chose to cancel the movie critic uh, on The Hollywood Reporter was released. Uh, Also, of course, we have to talk about Deadpool and Wolverine, and I kind of want that to be the main thing. Uh, Like last week, I'm going to save the best for last. We'll talk about Deadpool and Wolverine after. Let's start with um, the so-so news, the movie critic. Let's start with then we'll go to the bad news. Doctor Who, <laughs> Rip Doctor Who, and then we'll go on to um, the good news, which is Deadpool and Wolverine. So let's just uh, not waste any time and get right into this first article. I love this 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 uh, poster graphic. Once upon a time, the movie critic, <laughs> the most amazing Hollywood movie you'll never see. And you got Cliff Booth, Tarantino, Tom Cruise. Um, I, I, I'm assuming that's. Uh, that's him typing up the script or whatever. Uh, Hollywood, Hollywood, excuse me. How Quentin Tarantino's The Movie Critic fell apart inside the messy late hour collapse of the director's mysterious final feature amid wild script and casting rumors, Tom Cruise, and a fully onboard Sony Pictures. This is by uh, Boris Kitt, Pamela McClintock, and James Hebert. Again, via the Hollywood Reporter. So let's just dive right into this. Let's see. Uh, let's see what the heck happened because I was, I was very excited for this movie, and I'm very sad that it's not happening. I trust myself as a writer. I trust my process. Quintino declared on stage at the Adobe Max Creative Conference in 2016. I never try to take anything out too soon. If I do realize it, I put it back. The acclaimed filmmaker added, "Not every film needs to be made." Not every movie should be made. Wise words. <laughs> and one of those movies that will not be made, as the world learned on April 17th, is The Movie Critic, which was billed as Tarantino's 10th and final film. The project initially focused on a writer working for a fictional porn magazine in the late 1970s and then quietly evolved amid a flurry of, of rewrites into something resembling a spin-off of his ninth film, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, with some potential meta twists, which we'll explain later. Oh, that's interesting. That was that I don't remember if that where that was reported, but I remember hearing that, not um at somewhere on Twitter. And so I'm I'm curious to see where that was going. The decision came as quite a shock given the project was expected to film at least one sequence this year and they go into full production in early 2025 with an A-list talent attached. Brad Pitt, reteaming with Tarantino for the third time, quote, I don't recall him rewriting so much and pushing a start date once he had a movie in mind, says one one agency partner. Interesting. A studio was never officially announced, but two sources close to the now- scuttled project tell Hollywood Reporter that Sony Pictures was firmly on board after ushering 2019's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood to blockbuster status. That film grossed $377.4 million globally to rank as the writer-director's biggest movie behind Django Unchained, $425.4 million. 
Tarantino felt like he found a new compatriot in Sony Studios chief Tom Rothman after having made nearly all his previous films with Harvey Weinstein. Sources say the mood on the Sony lot isn't one of disappointment, however. Yeah, so I, if you don't remember, I think it was after the um, Harvey Weinstein Me Too debacle, uh, Tarantino opted to take his business el elsewhere. Rightly so. And um, uh, Sony ended up being the ones to get Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And uh, it seems that's where he's happiest. Um, and, and it's safe to say he'll probably produce whatever his 10th and final film will be there alongside whatever he does next, assuming he continues to work um, in the industry via television. Uh, I, I doubt they're going to produce any plays that he writes, but um, you never know. You never know. It's Quentin Tarantino. Those who know Tarantino, those who know Tarantino, who had no comment for this story, aren't saying precisely why he shelved the film, only that he had grown more excited by other ideas. He has a lot of scripts that he's thrown away, says one longtime talent representative familiar with Tarantino's thinking. The filmmaker had previously emphasized that he liked the idea of going out on top which perhaps added legacy preser preserving pressure to his selection of a final film. Tarantino and Sony have still, uh, still have every intention of partnering on whichever project the filmmaker makes instead. Well, there you go. He's a pure artist, says one source close to the filmmaker, who noted his nine, his nine movies all have been original stories in an era rife with family IP franchises. With one caveat, Jackie Brown was adapted from an L... Elmore Leonard novel. I didn't know that. Interesting. That was a good movie. Uh, Tarantino originally confirmed his intention to make the movie critic last year, saying it was based on a guy who really lived but was never really famous, and he used to write movie reviews for a porno rag. As I said last week, I, I, if if they were going to go full bore on, on a porno rag, uh, I'm kind of glad that's uh, not happening. Because I think porn is um, a disgrace in our society. So uh, I don't know how it would have been used. So I shouldn't, I shouldn't assume. But uh, it's better safe than sorry, I'd say. While the character study description hardly sounded as grabby as the idea behind some of his favorite film titles, such as Kill Bill and Pulp Fiction, few doubted the result would be anything less than an event picture. With the casting of Pitt to reprise the laconic cool stuntman cliff booth the movie critic may have morphed into something more akin to his novelization once upon his novelization of once upon okay you know what pause this is the novelization that they are talking about uh so the movie morphed into something more akin to his novelization of once upon this book <laughs> which had a lot more of booth's story than was seen in the movie. Tarantino reportedly spent five years writing Once Upon a Time in Hollywood as a novel before deciding to make it into a movie. Again, showing that he can pivot deeply, deep into the process. Okay, so I haven't read this yet, but I am very excited to, because I know that this dives into um, some of the backstories and, and just creating a lore for uh, this universe, which he clearly loves. I mean, he clearly loves old Hollywood. And I think that's why Once Upon is one of his best movies, because you can see the passion uh, for old Hollywood in that movie and seemingly in this book. So, gosh, I, I just I'm very excited. I'm reading three books at the same time right now. So um, I got to I got to prioritize this because I'm very, very excited to read this. Ninety nine cents. No, not ninety nine cents. Five dollars. At Ollie's, criminal. I mean, I'm glad I didn't have to pay the full thirty bucks for it. But what is this doing in Ollie's? <laughs> uh, diamond in the rough. Diamond in the rough. I can't complain. Okay, the film's exact story details are not known, but sources familiar with the project dropped a couple intriguing ideas to THR that Tarantino was toying with. One idea was that the Hollywood set tale could serve as Tarantino's goodbye metaverse with the director's early movies existing in the same era of the movie critic, which could work given that the film has a 70s vibe. 
That way, Tarantino could bring back some of his stars from his earlier works to reprise their iconic characters in a movie within a movie moments to play fictional versions of themselves as actors who play those characters. Another idea that the film could include a movie theater where some characters could potentially interact with a budding future a future auteur, such as a 16-year-old Tarantino who worked as an usher at a Torrance porn theater. Quote, I was, I was tall enough to get away with it, Tarantino once said. Oh boy, yeah, I remember hearing about that. <laughs> In recent months, the production has been, as Jules Winfield might put it, beset on all sides by the tyrannies of casting rumors. At one point, the movie critic was going to shoot a, sh a short sequence in February with actor-wrestler Paul Walter Hauser, but a source close to the actor says he was never involved. There were also reports that previous Tarantino stars John Travolta, Jamie Foxx, and Margot Robbie were going to take part in his cinematic farewell. There was even speculation that Tom Cruise would be in the film. Cruz in Tarantino lore was first eyed for Pitt's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood role, but scheduling forced him to bow out. Fans were shipping a Cruz Tarantino pairing, but the movie critic was actually going to wasn't actually going to bring them together, according to sources. Cruz hadn't even met with the filmmaker on a roll. Well, that's disappointing because I would love to see a Tom Cruise uh Tarantino movie. So again, my hopes are that he comes back for uh this role but i know he's got like he's got a um alejandro niratu movie uh in the works he's doing um a remake of the gauntlet i believe with scarlett johansson and god knows how many more mission impossible movies he's working on i know he, the next one is is almost in the can um and, and, the, and i'm sure there's going to be more uh plus top gun three so tom cruise is a busy man um I really do hope he can figure out a way to fit this into his schedule. If there's a role for him. Cause wow, that would be so what a way to go out. <laughs> uh, Tom Cruise and Tarantino. Wow. One person who did meet with Tarantino, however, was actress Olivia Wilde. Wilde is said to have sat with Tarantino this year, though it's not clear if it was for a role or just a general meeting. A source did point out to a character, a source did point to a character in one draft of the script based on a legendary film critic, Pauline Kale. Okay, that's interesting. Another actor who might have been closing on a role was David Krumholtz, last seen in Oppenheimer. Sources said Krumholtz was being eyed, though it's unclear for what role. The question now becomes, what's next? Tarantino has been talking about retiring since as far back as 2009, when he said he wanted to quit directing films before he was 60. The filmmaker turned 61 in March. He's been talking about ending with 10 films since at least 2014. Some of his previous con previously considered yet unmade projects include a R-rated Star Trek movie. Oh, that would have been awesome. A Kill Bill Volume 3 and a Django Zorro team-up. I think that was turned into a comic book, if I'm not mistaken. Whatever his eventual choice of a project, the tenth and final designation will surely result in an unprecedented amount of fan and media anticipation for the film, which perhaps only adds to Tarantino's self-generated burden to get his last one right. I think again, there's a there's a discourse on Twitter of, of like, why does he have to make ten films? Why does he have to make ten final films? And again. He wants to go out on top. He doesn't want to go out um, turning out things that I guess are not um, up to par with what his standards would be. So uh, again, I respect it. Um, but I think he's also putting maybe too much pressure on himself to uh, overperform on this. But again, the guy has a incredible filmography. He deserves to, to quit and retire the way he wants to retire. So more power to him. He also mentioned a unique project that he was toying with. I'm working on a film critic project about the year in, the cin in cinema in 1970, especially in development of New Hollywood, Tarantino said. I'm doing it as a book. Am I doing it as a documentary? I'm trying to figure out what that is. Okay. So he could resurrect the movie critic in some other form, maybe as a documentary or a book. Again, that was um, 
back in 2009, I believe, during the the Adobe thing. Yeah, look, I I really hope that um, this story comes to fruition someday. I mean, look, I think as a guilty pleasure, I would love to see a metaverse Tarantino movie. I think he has, again, as I said last week, I think he has some of the most vibrant and interesting and fun characters um, outside of franchise filmmaking that I think it'd be fun to revisit that and see that again. But um, I don't think, I think that kind of dips into franchise territory. And I don't think that's something Tarantino is particularly interested in. I mean, he toyed with a Star Trek movie um, as the article pointed out, and he passed on that. Um, I feel like if he's going to make one final movie, it's going to be something that really speaks to uh, the heart of who he is um, and just what, what interests him. Uh, I, I love Tarantino doing, I mean, like his Westerns and his love letters to Hollywood are, are unmatched in my opinion. I think they're fantastic. Once upon a time in Hollywood being the most prominent. I think uh, Django Unchained, Hateful Eight are great. I would love to just see him make Westerns, like a bunch of Westerns. I think he has, he just does such great Western storytelling. And he, he he's the only modern filmmaker working today who's able to recapture like the feeling of sp- of old spaghetti westerns you know spaghetti westerns had just a a uh, uniqueness to them spaghetti westerns are like the different types of pasta out there they're all different but they're all bizarre and twirly and 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 fun and uh tarantino i think is the only filmmaker in recent memory to recapture that fun zaniness of spaghetti westerns but also had like a a, a creativity and a weight to them that was unparalleled by most american um spaghetti westerns or american westerns i hope tarantino brings this project back in some capacity maybe as a book or a novel whatever it turns out to be because it sounds like it kind of got away from him Um, or at least he had so many different ideas about what it could be that it um it morphed into something completely different so we'll see what his final film is. But um, again, as I said last time, I, I'm sure it'll be great and I'm sure it'll be exactly what he wants it to be. Uh, and I wait with uh, bated breath and anticipation for what that will be. All right, let's move on to the bad news. Let's get this over with. We got another Doctor Who article that um, ruffled my feathers. Let's pull it up. Doctor Who regenerates. How Chudy got was historic casting. Russell T. Davies' return and the Disney Plus deal revolutionizes the franchise. That's rich. Revolutionizes the franchise. Oh my gosh. Oh, this is going to be fun. By Elise Schaefer via Variety. Okay. When Shudi Gatwa makes his first appearance as the 15th Doctor in the science fiction series Doctor Who, he isn't wearing any pants. I'm not sure who is a fan of that um, or why Russell T. Davies made that decision. It's a very questionable and bizarre and um, borderline creepy decision. In a 60th anniversary special release in December, the previous Doctor, played by series icon David Tennant, subverted the show's long-standing expectations of regeneration. Subvert your expectations, fans. We know better than you. We're going to introduce something that you we know you're probably not going to like. That's going to probably rustle some feathers, but hey, diversity and inclusion is more important than good storytelling instead of just a normal regeneration or a normal two-doctor story. Okay, quick quick caveat. My, one of my theories uh, of how they were going to in- integrate Chudi Gawa in the 60th was that the second special was going to end on some sort of cliffhanger where um, some world-ending plot happened um assuming this was going to be like three three uh specials telling one story instead of three separate stories with don and the doctor um that the story would continue into the second special something devastating would happen and the doctor would be like how am i going to get out of this and judy got was doctor and ruby sunday show up and say hey i'm the doctor and i'm here to help like because he's 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 lived that future and he knows he has to be there to help him and so you have your you can have your cake and eat it too by having two doctors 
in the special together. You can see Shuri Gao before he regenerates, and you they say bye, and then David Tennant dies and regenerates. But now we had to have this stupid um, let's retire the old doctor and get the old fan, the old racist, sexist fans away from Doctor Who, and then let's do this new thing that this small minority, this small vocal minority of fans are going to love. Stupid. Okay. Instead of simply transforming into the next Doctor, he literally splits in half, bringing Gatwa's Doctor into the world alongside him. In the process, the two divide the clothes of Tenet's, of Tenet's Doctor being between them, leaving Gawa in nothing but a dress shirt and a pair of tidy whiteies. So creepy! Does no one else find that creepy? Gosh! Kid show! I mean, I know they've had partial nudity in, 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 in this before, but like... Oh my gosh, just so weird how it played out. So weird. Yes. That was a first costume fitting infectious laugh. Are you joking? Voila. It was an apt entrance for Gatwa, who bubbly, fearless, his bubbly, fearless personality shone through his breakout performance in the ever effervescent Eric on Netflix's Sex Education and as artist Ken in Greta Gerwig's Barbie. I forgot he was in Barbie. It also marks a new era of the beloved Doctor Who with series stalwart Russell T. Davies returning as showrunner, writer, and executive producer. More like a death nail. Since the premiere in 1963, the seminal show has become part of the fabric of British culture, reaching across generations and prompting many a dinner table arguments about which Doctor is the best. The original series went off air in 1989 after seven actors played the role. Davies is back at the helm, and God was making history as the first openly queer black actor to take on the core role of the Doctor. Who cares? Honestly. Gosh. I don't care if he's queer. I don't care if he's black. I mean, it's, it's, it is, it, okay, I will say, it is historic that, like, he is the first actor, first black actor to play the Doctor. I'll give him that. That is actually pretty cool. But gosh, I don't care about his sexual orientation. What difference does that make? Why should we care about what he's attracted to? What difference does that make for the quality of the show? feel like anyone that has a problem with someone who's not a straight white man playing this character, you're not really truly a fan of the show. You've not been watching because the show is about regeneration. And the doctor is an alien. Why would they only choose to be this sort of person? Okay, the doctor doesn't choose to regenerate into somebody. It's a coin toss. He regenerates and he has to deal with what he's got. Sometimes he doesn't like what he's got. Sometimes he loves what he's got. Of course, no one is complaining about him being black. That's not the issue. It's the bizarre sexualization of the character. And the feminization of the character, honestly. Like, Gott was playing him in a very feminine way. That's not becoming of how the past, what, 14, almost forgot, 15 actors have played the Doctor. So stop making this an issue about, oh, he's black, he's black. That's the issue, he's black. No one cares. We're fine with him being black. Of course, a straight white male is not the only person who can play the Doctor. Hundreds of people have been suggested to play the Doctor that have varied from male to female to black to white. And a lot of people don't agree that the Doctor should be a female, but it's been suggested, so... Gosh. See, like, this is how they're trying to control the narrative. It's like, you're sexist, you're racist. And that's not the issue, and they know it's not the issue. And if they don't, then they're more stupid than I thought. Davies echoes that logic. They weren't exactly the straightest men in the past. A trailblazer of LGBTQ... Blah, blah, blah. Gosh, alphabet soup. LGBTQ television. Davies created the original Queer as Folk in 1989. In 2001's It's a Sin. That's an, that's an ironic title. 
and about how God was doctor is different. He says, you're talking about someone who, who does have a lightness and a joy about him. To me, chimes with queer energy. It's very rarely driving the story vehemently, but you will see moments, you will see moments exploring it. We're not delivering a neutered doctor. So if you have a lightness and joy about life, that means you're gay. I'm a positive, upbeat person. I have a I have a beautiful wife and, and a kid. Am I gay? <laughs> oh my gosh, this is so stupid. <laughs> oh. They weren't exactly the straightest men in the past, says the guy who wrote the Dr. D- Dr. Rose romance, says the guy who wrote the Dr. Uh, Martha sort of romance, says the guy who, who, <laughs> says the, says, oh my gosh, I forgot he didn't write Matt Smith, I was about to mention River Song, but he didn't write River Song, to be fair. Dude, come on. Come on, you wrote the doctor to be in love with Rose. Do not tell me otherwise. Come on. Give me a freaking break. Queer energy. My gosh. We're not delivering a neutered doctor. Oh, so the doctors have been neutered in the past. You're saying that he's had this this queer he's he's had to come, he's had to keep this queer energy pent up and he's finally coming out now is that, is that is that what's happening? Gosh, ridiculous! All right. <clears throat> While the doctor's sexuality has never been labeled in Gatwa's first episode as the Lee, the Church on Ruby Road, which premiered as a traditional uh, Doctor Who Christmas special, viewers see him dancing in a kilt. It's a skirt. I'm sorry, but. He's twirling around in in what looks like what I guess is a kilt, but it's a skirt. They, they want us to think it's a skirt. They want us to think it's a skirt. No one is no one is looking at it and thinking, oh, he's he's got a kilt on. They think we're idiots. They think we're stupid and we're not going to get this. And and I see right through it. Dancing in a kilt skirt, referencing his long hot summer with Harry Houdini. And though Davies insists he didn't set out to be a revolutionary, he didn't set out to be revolutionary in casting the next Doctor. We auditioned men, women, black, white, non-binary. Oh gosh, non-binary actors. I mean, ugh. and actors whose sexuality was their own private matter. He said, "What difference does it make what their sexual preference is? What's in between their legs?" My. Goodness, these people are sick. These people are sick. <laughs> Their own private matter. Okay, 95% of people who are non-binary or ecosexual or whatever the hell new weird, bizarre sexual preference or gender identification is, most of them have it wide out there. Gosh. They think we're stupid. And and they they're talking in this language that that is just built on nonsense and not truth. It's very hard for anyone to stop me doing these things. He continues. Well, I'm, I'm sure, Russell. I'm sure no one's gonna be able to stop you from from your destruction of the show that you helped revive. You'd have to be pretty brave. A pretty brave executive to say, don't go there to me. I'm sure there are people thinking that, but I won't work with them, would I? Oh, yeah, I'm sure you wouldn't be doing a uh, death nail to Doctor Who if you weren't able to get your way and do all the weird perverted stuff that you're you're doing and focusing on sexuality and, and queerness and things that just don't matter for Doctor Who. The broadcaster not only said yes, but... Davies asked whether he, but asked Davies whether he'd want to reinvent the show once again, this time for a worldwide streamer, a streaming partner. The BBC had found one in Disney Plus. Oh boy, here we go. Where the new season will release worldwide on May 10th at 7 p.m. Eastern time, excluding the UK, where it will launch May 11th at midnight. Uh, BBC 
iPlayer and air that night on BBC One. A choice that's maddened some British Whovians who, if they don't want to stay up past their bedtimes, will have to wait until the next morning to stream the new episodes as they dodge spoilers. Yeah, that's really weird. The new iteration was given a two-season order, and Davies says it feels like such a fresh fresh start that he has to has to urge to call it season one. Despite the 60-year-plus history, it's a new show, he says. It's a new show? Yeah, this is, I've had a gripe about this since they announced it. Like, this is... This is a this this is why they did what they did in the 60th anniversary. This is why David Tennant splits into two doctors. They did this to tell the old fans who are they think are sexist and racist and misogynist to here's David Tennant, classic doctor. He's retired now. Screw off. We're gonna do our own woke, uh, more vibrant, more queer, happy Doctor Who. Which actually works because classic Doctor Who fans and um, post 60th Doctor Who fans and people who've just been fed up with with the Jodie Whittaker run and and the Chris Chibnall run, they can now just they have that bookmark to end on. And for a lot of people, it ended even sooner with with Peter Capaldi regenerating. This is what they want. They don't want the core audience. They don't want the original fans that made the show what it was. They want a new, smaller, <clears throat> diverse, and inclusive and queer audience who are not going to make this two-season run a success. And if they do, like it's just, again, they're going to continue burning money because we know, we know that Doctor Who has been tanking since, uh, I mean, I hate to say it, but even since Peter Capaldi, the ratings have not been what they were. I love Peter Capaldi as a doctor, but that's just the truth. So, gosh, a new show. Yeah, okay, all right. Davies has, as Davies had admired franchises like Star Trek and Star Wars making the leap to streaming and jumped at the chance to bring Doctor Who to a global audience with the transition to give the show a higher production value. Integral to that was Bad Wolf, the production company founded by the industry veterans Julie Gardner and Jane Tranther, with whom he had worked with on the first iteration of Doctor Who. Uh, Gardner says, I wanted every person in the world to watch Doctor Who. Uh, we can just get bigger and get better reach, and it feels like exactly where Doctor Who should be. I'm sorry, wasn't the show on Netflix? And even before then, it's on, I mean, it's on uh, HBO Max right now. What are you talking about? <laughs> Disney Plus having a, I mean, maybe Disney Plus has a larger international reach, I guess, but American audiences weren't necessarily starved for Doctor Who. I don't think Disney Plus is something revolutionary, but whatever. All right, Gatwa was the last person auditioned for the role back in January 2022, after the production had seen around 20 actors and believed it had found its new lead. Casting director Andy Pryor calls Gatwa's agent. We think we got him, but like Rogue Choice, we just wanted to see Chudy, Gatwa says, reenacting the phone conversation. Do you think he'd be up for it? Indeed, he would. Just the week before, Gawa texted his agent that he loved to play a character like Doctor Who or Willy Wonka. I was like, I was like this manifestation man. I was like, this is manifestation man. Gawa said, still looking astonished. To prepare, he rewatched all of Davies' episodes in that week, and I became a diehard fan. Well, at least he watched the uh, those episodes. That's good. I um, hope he watched classic Doctor Who because that's kind of important. <laughs> During the audition, Davies, who read each potential doctor, read with each potential doc. During the audition, Davies, who read with each potential doctor, was blown away. I was actually, I actually wanted to put down the script and say, "You've got the part." He says, "I literally knew then." And although Gott was groundbreaking casting, was met with much praise. There were, of course, some haters. Got what to the naysayers? Simply don't watch. Turn off the TV. Go and touch grass, please. For I'm not going to say that. Okay, that's 
This is never a good idea. This is never a good idea to say that to your fan base. I have, again, I, I, I said this last week and I'll say it again. I never had a problem with Gatwa when he was initially cast. I thought, cool. It's like the first doctor with a mustache. That was actually one of my first thoughts. Like, okay, this guy could be really good. Um, and look, do I have problems with, with, uh, the way Gatwa dresses, um, and his feminization and his, his chest exposed and all that. And, you know, dressing half naked most of the time. Yeah. And it's clearly been infused in the doctor's character quite a bit. Um, but that's the issue. Not Gatwa himself, not the fact that he's a black man. In fact, again, it's actually really cool that a, a black guy is playing the doctor. It is historic. No one, no one black has ever played the character. And I think that's pretty awesome. It's this queer stuff that it's fine. You know what? It's fine if, if Gawa wants to be queer. It's his life, his choice. He'll have to, to reconcile with that at the end of his life, but um, it's his choice. Why does it have to be part of the show? Why does it have to be part of a family show? This queerness and sexualization and, and, and uh, cross-dressing. Why does that need to be part of a family show? It doesn't. It doesn't. Oh, this is going to be interesting. There is a criticism that Doctor Who is a show that appeals to children and that a queer actor playing the Doctor will reach more kids than ever with its new home on Disney+, Plus, which is a disturbing idea to homophobes. They know. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, let's, let's, let's do this. Let's go. Davy sees the new show's wide, wider reach as an opportunity for, to open young people's minds. Oh, okay. I need, we need our minds to be open to the, the fluidity of life, the fluidity of our bodies, the fluidity of everything, because there's no definitive truth. Okay. Um, I had to pause there for a second. Um, so my kid had to uh, take his nap and his bedroom is right next to uh my office where i record so i had to move into my closet so uh trying to cover things up so hey we're rolling with it um if you're listening on youtube then uh yeah you're seeing this if you're listening on audio then uh you know you're not missing out on much Davies, I think if you are six years old, you don't care. Not at all, he says. But nonetheless, as the world darkens, I do think the world is darkening around queer rights. There is a joy and a celebration, and there is a community. Whether you're 12 years old or just beginning to work out who you are at 62, you've never been who you are, or and or and you've never been who you are, or 61 years old like I am, and beginning to worry about what we are in society. There is a hero out there cutting his way through the universe, looking da looking damn good in his suits and doing it with a laugh and a smile. Well, he's not wearing a suit, so unless you're con counting the El the uh, Elvis, the um, Beatles episode, <laughs> uh, which would be really exciting if the show wasn't in the pits where it is right now. So, <laughs> um. So Davies is saying that, uh, yeah, the Doctor is now a queer hero for people who uh, have gender dysphoria. And that this is supposed to be terrifying to homophobes. Okay, this is just bizarre and, and gross, manipulative, uh, victimizing... Uh, and taking advantage of people who struggle with their their identity, their sexual identity, their their gender identity. Um, those people need to be helped and brought to the truth, not um, secured in in their their um, in what is not true. Ridiculous! I, just, I have just. I have no respect for Russell T. Davies as a person. For those who continue to tell me that Doctor Who is not dead or that it's it's never been better. No, I'm sorry. You're not going to convince me of that because, no, the show is dead. The show is being um, uh, hijacked and in priority and prioritizing uh, agendas and not even just political agendas. Like, 
people have been lecturing me on this all week. I know that there are political agendas in Doctor Who, okay? Like climate stuff and all that. I understand that. This is just straight up lies about sex and gender, and it's a a an excuse for them to to uh, expose and to talk about constantly their sexual identity, which does not need to be into in a kid's family show. It doesn't. It just doesn't. You're not going to convince me otherwise. Doctor Who is made for kids. If you're making action figures that kids are buying, if you're making toys that kids are buying, it's geared towards kids. And like, look, I don't mind a little tongue in cheek humor if it's under the radar, if kids aren't picking this stuff up. That's fine. I don't mind romance or sexual tension. I think that's fine. But there is an issue with these people who are obsessed with their sexual identity and their queer identity. And that the world does not validate them and they need to be validated. They say they don't need to people to validate them, but then they are desperately crying out for shows to validate them or Hollywood to validate them. So which is it? Is it are you secure in your identity despite who supports you, or do you need Hollywood or the government to validate who you are? Which is it? Because it can't be both. So yep. Uh no surprise there, Doctor Who is dead. <laughs> Now let's move on to something I'm very happy to discuss and something that is a a beacon of light in this um, constantly uh, disappointing um, state of society that we're in. And that's the brand new trailer for Deadpool and Wolverine. Uh, Of course, this is the third installment in the Deadpool franchise, the first official movie to fully integrate the X-Men into the MCU as rumors, if rumors are led to be believed in a way that that Spider-Man No Way Home was integrating Sony characters into the multiverse. Uh, This movie is integrating Fox X-Men characters uh, and actors into the multiverse. And it's very exciting. If you grew up with, uh, if you're like me and you grew up on Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man, Hugh Jackman's Wolverine, just those original X-Men films. Um, it's an exciting time. And it's the only thing that you can really get excited about with the MCU these days. But um, yeah, the plot is sort of under wraps, um, at least as far as the big details go. But um, it seems like the TVA is recruiting, De- the TVA from Loki uh, is recruiting Deadpool to go on some universe saving mission. And Deadpool decides to yank um, not the Wolverine we know, but a Wolverine out of his universe to save the multiverse. And apparently his uh, his family and his loved ones uh, are all at stake. And uh, this Wolverine has, a, has experience with um, either attempting to save worlds or failing to save worlds, something like that. Because um, this Wolverine apparently let down his entire world. What does that mean? We don't know. We've seen some very interesting images of a devastated Wolverine in the trailer. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's not a Wolverine movie if Wolverine's not depressed and, and, uh, drinking his memories away from something that he done, he's done in his past that he's trying to forget. Um, so I, I'm glad to see that that's still consistent. Um, but the, the trailer is significant because this is the first time we're seeing Hugh Jackman return as Wolverine. He retired the role in 2017 with the wonderfully made, beautifully made Logan, um, an absolute incredible, an absolutely incredible movie, uh, directed by one of my favorite filmmakers, James Mangold. I know I criticize Mangold a lot for what he did with Indiana Jones and Dial of Destiny, but I don't think it's all his fault. Um, and I still think he's an incredible filmmaker despite everything that went down in that movie. So all that aside, uh, it doesn't take away from the fact that he's made great movies before, and, and he'll continue to make great movies. I mean, I'm, I'm so excited for his uh, his um, uh, Bob Dylan movie, A Complete Unknown. It's got to be good. But yes, Jackman retired Wolverine with Logan. He died in that movie. Spoilers for a uh, almost seven year old movie. <laughs> um, very emotional. Um, it, it's definitely you know you don't get a lot of chances to like properly say goodbye to your childhood heroes and your heroes that you grew up with. Um, and I remember 
seeing that that really affected me um and uh you know i i just love the story of wolverine um he's a very tortured soul but he's also a very fun character to watch at the same time and you know i i thought that we were we were done with wolverine i thought we'd never see hugh jackman do it again not even for secret wars um and i did mention this in my my blaze article if you if you haven't read uh my latest article for the blaze check that out um i'd really appreciate it um i did mention in that that Jackman said that he would consider coming back if Wolverine were to join the Avengers. But of course, the rights to um, the X-Men were caught up with Fox and not with Disney and Marvel. So um, that was unlikely to happen at all, if ever. And of course, now Fox has been absorbed by Disney. So now they have the X-Men rights and they can do everything they want. Um and you see references to the fact that Disney owns Fox. You have the 20th century logo um, is half sunken in the uh, in the desert or, or in the sand, wherever they are in that um, that limbo world. Um, I don't remember what they called it. <clears throat> I know there's a name for it in Loki where they're at. They're in the same place at the end of Loki season one where that giant purple um, monster cloud is eating things. And you see that in the trailer, too. Um, but yeah, so this is this is significant in that um, we're finally seeing uh, we're, we're seeing Hugh Jackman return um, in this movie. And I think at least if rumors are led to be believed, <clears throat> if rumors are to be believed that uh, Jackman is going to stick around for a, a good while as Wolverine to be um, the, the MCU's Wolverine uh, or at least until Secret Wars and then the universe will get rebooted and we'll see uh, a new actor play Wolverine. I don't, I don't know which is which. I mean, it's all speculation rumors at this point, but uh, <clears throat> I'd be happy, very happy to see Jackman continue playing Wolverine. And especially in that yellow costume. Oh my gosh. So, so cool. He looks great in that costume. I don't even need him to wear the helmet because, you know, he's got the, uh, he's got the, the Wolverine hair already. But um, I know we all know he's going to wear the, the helmet because there there are toys and, and busts and, and promotional art of him in that that have leaked out. Um, I don't know. If, I don't think I've ever wanted an action figure more than I've wanted Hugh Jackman's Wolverine in that costume. <laughs> um, but anyways, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm obviously gushing over Wolverine because he's one of my favorite comic book characters, one of my favorite movie characters. One thing I'll also say is I'm probably one of very few Marvel fans who doesn't need Deadpool and Wolverine or any Deadpool movie to be rated R. I just don't think that's something that's necessary to tell a good story with a character. Um, I mean, you can do a lot of, I know he's a foul mouth, ultra violent character, but there's a lot you can do within the PG 13 rating. Um, I just don't, I just don't think R rated content is typically uh, uh, good for uh, the soul. That's just me. But that being said, if this movie is just action and violence and language, um, it's not great. But it's something I can uh, at least be a little less apprehensive about if it was sexual content, you know, R-rated sexual content. And I don't think we're going to get any of that in this movie. I would be very surprised if if we did. Even then, I think the sex scene in, in the first Deadpool was relatively tame compared to uh what's in other movies i haven't seen the first deadpool in a long time so i could be wrong about that but uh um it, it seems like this movie is mostly focused on fan enjoyment even if it is an r-rated deadpool movie um and i'm just excited to see something good from marvel i mean this really feels like it's going to be the gargantuan hit that spider-man no way home was um and you know look I'll I'll go on my uh my woke soapbox again <laughs> and I'll say that uh Disney and Marvel are in denial about I think what's um causing them this downfall. Yes, it has to do with um the volume of content they're creating and um the rushed productions and the rushed scripts and just not making sure that the content they're putting out is good. But a lot of it has to do with wokeness. I think Buzz Lightyear would have at least been a moderate hit. The Buzz Lightyear movie, Lightyear, it would have been a moderate hit if that if there wasn't that stupid um, 
random, unnecessary uh, lesbian couple thrown in there for no reason whatsoever, which has no place in a kid's movie. Um, I think a lot of Marvel movies would be uh, better accepted if you didn't have the uh, political lecturing that was in The Falcon and the Winter Soldier or um, any of the stuff that has turned people off like the uh, uh, I never saw the Marvels, but um, Ant-Man and the Wasp and um, a lot of the weird stuff going on there and just the prioritizing of female heroes over male heroes um, and not allowing both to coexist um, heroically. And uh, it seems like Deadpool Wolverine is taking the Spider-Man No Way Home approach to uh, the MCU, which is crowd-pleasing and hopefully a good heartfelt story. I will say as much as I am not a fan of the R-rated content in Deadpool Wolverine or Deadpool, excuse me. Deadpool has always surprised me and that the stories in these movies are always heartfelt and always human and grounded and emotional. I really like Deadpool 2. I think Deadpool 2 is a better film than Deadpool 1. I know everybody loves Deadpool 1 and um, I appreciate Ryan Reynolds comments in that he says that um you know the first movie is a uh a romance a roman a romantic comedy essentially and the second movie is more of a family film um and I I appreciate that about both movies no matter how I feel about one over the other but I appreciate that 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 the approach the first thought is story how are we going to humanize a character like Deadpool, who sure, yeah, it's fun to see him kill bad guys and crack jokes and all that stuff that comes with Deadpool. But if you don't humanize the character, then we're not going to want to see him. And so I think Ryan Reynolds has really done a great job of doing that with the character beyond just giving us what we want to see, what we expect from Deadpool. And uh, I think we're going to see similar stuff in this movie here, too, with Especially with the story that's being set up, it seems like it's a very um, emotional story for both Wolverine and Deadpool. And when you have Wolverine in a movie, you have to kind of give the film some weight with his emotional struggle and his emotional arc and all that. So um, I think that's uh, it's just it's great to see. It's great to see that they're prioritizing character over anything else, over effects, over what's going to sell in a in a in a in a board meeting or what the statistics say and all these Marvel movies that have felt um, studio driven, not artist driven. And uh, one of the, the highlights of my blaze article was that guardians of the galaxy volume three came out and was kind of a beacon of hope of like, Oh wow. The MCU could actually still be good because I, it wasn't my favorite guardians movie. And I think it was way too dark, but James Gunn made a great, great movie. Something that you feel the passion behind. You feel the the humanity behind. And, I mean, it's too soon to say if Deadpool's going to be like that. But if it's the same team and if it's the same um, thought process of those first two Deadpool films. And it's Sean, Sean Levy, who um, is a great filmmaker and has um, done great in family entertainment um, and did great with Gosling with the Adam project and fam and uh, family guy, free guy, <laughs> not family guy. Um, he's proven himself to be a great filmmaker who, who prioritizes story and character and heart and emotion. Um, Cause if, when that's the core of your movie, all the special effects, all the jokes, all the comedy, all the fun stuff, it makes it all the more impactful because it's 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 all here to support a human story. And that's what makes great movies, in my opinion, is relating to somebody and not being drowned by just the, 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 the fun stuff, the fluff, as I call it. Uh, the fluff is only as good as the heart of the story. The heart of the story is not beating and firing on all cylinders. The fluff is just fluff. And I think Deadpool Wolverine is not going to be just fluff. I think Deadpool Wolverine is going to be a good movie. Um, I think it's going to be a lot of fun for diehard um, OG classic Marvel movie fans like myself. And I think it's going to be a breath of fresh air for people who just want to go to the movies and have a good time and not be lectured on gender 
and politics and orange man bad and all of the annoying and just nauseating things that are constantly being pumped into Hollywood content. This could be uh, either a, as I said in the article, um, I know I keep, I know I keep uh, bringing that up, but I, I, if you guys do go read it, I would appreciate that. Um, it's either going to be um, a sign of, of hope that things are going to improve in the MCU and Disney, hopefully overall. This was approved by Chapek, so that might say something too, Ugh. or as, say something about the, the, a, a, a further decline in quality. Not not Chapek himself, or it's a sign that uh, this is going to be another adrenaline rush, and we're just going to go back to crap. I hate to say the word crap, but I don't know what else to describe what we've been getting from Marvel and Disney. And, uh, you know, I don't have a lot of hope that things are going to improve based on, you know, what I've seen and what I've heard about the behind the scenes at Disney with with things going on with with Moana 2 and um, just Bob Iger thinking sequels are going to continue to save Disney um, when we're in a different time in the culture. (laughs) Uh, It's it's very interesting. I don't have a lot of hope, but I, I, I hope that at the very least, this could signal good things coming from Marvel. Um, and for now, uh, being excited for a Marvel movie is good enough for me. So that's the show. We covered quite a bit of ground. And again, this was a bit of a rehash of last week in that we covered a uh, movie critic, Doctor Who, and a trailer. And um, hopefully next week will be, will be a little more variety in the news. Um, because I'm kind of, I'm just tired of talking about Doctor Who. Like, I know it's dead. Some people are in denial about that. Um, and that think that this, this is going to be conducive to, um, bringing the show back to what it used to be. And I just don't think so. I think it's, it's, uh, driven, driven by very egotistical people, um, by very sick and perverted people. And I just, I just don't want to be a part of that anymore. I don't care. It's dead. You're not going to convince me otherwise. I applaud you for trying, but enjoy your uh, your queer Doctor Who, folks, because I'm sure it's not going to last very long. If you guys like the show and like what I do, please hit subscribe and hit the like button. Uh, you can check out more episodes of the podcast um, and just more stuff coming down the pipeline. I'm still working on my um, my video essays, and I hope to get those. I hope to start production on those very soon. Uh, I say production as if I'm shooting, like going on location or whatever. Just like I, I've been writing, I've been writing a lot, and I and I hope to shoot those very soon. So, uh, if you guys want to see some uh, uh, content from me that's not talking about the news, not talking about wokeness, just talking about movies and why I love movies and what I love about certain movies, that'll be uh, that'll be fun for you guys to see. So, uh, stay tuned. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Stay tuned for that. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, um, thank you again for listening and for watching. I hope you have a fantastic day and a fantastic week. God bless and peace out.